Welcome to this video, the 14th video in my series of videos on George Cantor's 1895 and 1897 articles on the theory of aggregates and transfinite numbers. Section 14 is titled The Ordinal Numbers of Well-Ordered Aggregates. This section starts off with the notion of ordinal number, which is defined and distinguishes itself from the more general concept of ordinal type by ordinal numbers being the ordinal types of well-ordered aggregates. This section will look at addition and multiplication of ordinal numbers and some of the basic properties of these operations. So, bearing in mind that ordinal numbers are a special kind of ordinal type, it follows that many of the results from section 8 on addition and multiplication of ordinal types will be immediately or almost immediately applicable to ordinal numbers. It's worth therefore being familiar with the results from section 8 because they're not necessarily repeated in this section. Lowercase Greek letters are usually used to denote ordinal numbers. We see that, given any pair of ordinal numbers, either they are equal or one is smaller than the other. This is a consequence of theorem n from the previous section, section 13. The relations of equality, less than and greater than between ordinal numbers is defined in terms of similarity. The less than relation is shown by theorem b to be a transitive relation between ordinal numbers. Addition of ordinal numbers is a special case of addition of ordinal types, and so needs no additional definition. That the union aggregate of f and g is obviously well ordered follows from theorem E of section 12. For example, if we have a well-ordered aggregate with only two elements E0 and E1, then replace E0 with F and E1 with G, then the resulting aggregate, the uni aggregate of F and G, is well-ordered. Prior to theorem C of this section being proved, then it could be questioned whether the sum of two ordinal numbers is again another ordinal number, and not simply an ordinal type. However, Theorem C guarantees that the sum of two ordinal numbers is indeed again an ordinal number. However, even without Theorem C of this section, Theorem E of section 12 would indicate that the union aggregate of two well-ordered aggregates is itself a well-ordered aggregate, and therefore that the sum of two ordinal numbers is again an ordinal number. Theorem D is self-explanatory and is explained by the comments on the previous few lines in the book. Theorem E shows that addition of ordinal numbers is associative, but follows anyway from the results of section 8 on more general ordinal types. Of course we can be confident that both alpha plus beta in brackets plus gamma and alpha plus beta plus gamma in brackets both represent ordinal numbers by theorem C from this section. Multiplication of ordinal numbers is again immediately applicable from the results from section 8. However, we have to be sure that the product of two ordinal numbers is again an ordinal number, which is guaranteed by the results of theorem E from section 12. Multiplication of ordinal numbers is left cancellable, and we see that the ordinal number 1 commutes with any ordinal number and is a multiplicative identity. Although the addition and multiplication symbols are used to express addition and multiplication of ordinal numbers, we always have to be aware of the fact that addition and multiplication of ordinal numbers is not the same as addition and multiplication in elementary arithmetic. This is particularly true, in my opinion, in the case of the expression beta minus alpha, which we see in point 10 on page 155. The expression beta minus alpha is merely a symbol which is used to denote the unique ordinal number delta which solves the equation alpha plus delta equals beta, with alpha less than beta. The symbol beta minus alpha is not necessarily to be considered as literally subtraction of an ordinal number from another ordinal number. The uniqueness of beta minus alpha as the solution to the equation follows from theorem D of this section. Thus we see that it's not possible to say, for example, that beta minus alpha is equal to minus alpha plus beta, or that alpha plus beta minus alpha in brackets is equal to alpha plus beta in brackets minus alpha, or any similar rearrangements which may be valid when doing elementary arithmetic. Therefore, rather than viewing the equality expressed in point 10 as representing a cancellation of alpha, I personally view this as representing the possibility of replacing the symbol alpha plus beta minus alpha in brackets in any expression in which it occurs with the equivalent expression beta. The s which represents the remainder in relation to the explanation of point 10 is of course a well-ordered aggregate since it's a part of a well-ordered aggregate g. Therefore, the ordinal type of s is in fact an ordinal number. It's this ordinal number which is denoted by the symbol beta minus alpha. The proofs of points 12 and 13 are as shown on the screen.
that beta 1, beta 2 and so on is a simply infinite series means that there is a simple ordering defined on the series of betas, of which there are infinitely many. Note that the betas are not necessarily in order of magnitude. Thus, even though we have beta i is lower in rank than beta i plus 1, we do not necessarily have that beta i is less than beta i plus 1. Point 16, therefore, shows that the sum of an infinite number of ordinal numbers is again an ordinal number with the help of theorem e from section 12. Recall that theorem e of section 12 did not require the aggregate g of that theorem to be a finite aggregate. Thus we're justified in asserting that the aggregate g of page 156 is a well-ordered aggregate. The equality of 17 can be shown by considering a suitable one-to-one -one correspondence between appropriate aggregates. The argument from points 18 to 21 shows that any simply infinite series of ordinal numbers gives rise to a fundamental series of ordinal numbers. The inequality of point 20 can be justified since the union aggregates g1, g2 up to g nu, corresponding to alpha nu, is a segment of the union aggregate of g1, g2 up to g nu plus 1, which has ordinal number alpha nu plus 1. The inequality of point 20 also justifies the expression alpha nu plus 1 minus alpha nu in point 21. The bottom of page 157 and top of page 158 show that the number beta satisfies the conditions outlined in section 10 on page 131, which would identify beta as the limiting element of the fundamental series of ordinal numbers just derived. Recall that the limit of a fundamental series when it exists is unique. That beta is the ordinal number that is next in order of magnitude after all of the alphas is guaranteed by the fact that, as shown in the preceding paragraphs, if beta primed is less than beta, then alpha nu is greater than beta primed, for all nu greater than or equal to nu naught, for some nu naught. The formula in point 22 is obtained by replacing each of the betas in 16 with the appropriate expression in terms of alphas, as defined in point 21. The proofs of point 23 and point 24 are as shown on the screen. The number class, ZA, is the aggregate of all ordinal numbers which have cardinal number equal to A, where A is a transfinite cardinal. Similar comments apply here to what I've made in previous videos regarding the classes of types. The two different cardinal numbers may have identical classes of types. For example, the class of types for Aleph naught is identical to the class of types of Aleph naught plus 1. Similarly, two different cardinal numbers may have identical number classes, Thus, z aleph naught is identical to z aleph naught plus 1. All transfinite cardinals have a corresponding number class, but wherever possible, it would seem appropriate to use the simplest possible representation for the number class. Therefore, z aleph naught would be preferred to z aleph naught plus 1, and so forth. Since ordinal numbers are a certain kind of ordinal type, then it follows that each number class is a partial aggregate of some corresponding class of types. Note that the first number class is different to other number classes, in that it's the only one that contains ordinal numbers which also have different cardinal numbers. In each of the number classes corresponding to transfinite cardinals, all of the ordinal numbers belonging to that number class have the same cardinal number. This division of ordinal numbers into distinct number classes is, in many ways, necessary, otherwise we may be tempted to try to speak of the aggregate of all ordinal numbers, which leads to a logical contradiction. The aggregates of ordinal numbers that we speak of must be limited in some way. This division of ordinal numbers into number classes is also sometimes referred to as the limitation principle. See also page 60 of Jordan's introduction to this book. The results of this section are some of the most useful results and will be used repeatedly during the remaining sections of this book. Thank you for watching. If you found this video useful, then please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. You can see more videos on various topics on my channel, and if you have any suggestions for topics for future videos, then please feel free to let me know and I'll try my best to put something together. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and keep an eye out for new videos being uploaded to my channel.